Okay, hello students, I uh, hope you're all well. Um, stop scratching myself now. Um, this is the lecture for the PowerPoint on the contexts in Oscar Wilde, um, the importance of being earnest in particular. Uh, we're going to talk about the culture and the society contexts um, this morning and you can find this PowerPoint on Moodle under uh, the importance of being earnest. Okay, so I'm going to tell you when I click through each slide. If you need to pause this, open the slides, um, that's absolutely fine. So I was just talking over the content, the title slides. I'm going to click onto the next slide now. There we go. Uh, so its title is The Political Context in the 1890s. Um, you may think and I, um, the importance of being earnest isn't a very political play, uh, but particularly Lady Bracknell makes a number of um, funny satirical speeches obviously she's not being satirical Wilde is being satirical through her about the the ruling class which she was a member of um, but although she's a member of the ruling class the British ruling class had gradually given away certain levels of power throughout the 19th century um, and by the 1890s you could say that Britain had one of the most representative democracies in Europe um, this was probably driven by the ruling classes fear of revolution and social protest. Revolution abroad, uh, but social protest at home. And there was a group called the Chartists who were very well organised in the first half of the 19th century, demanding uh, parliamentary reform in particular. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, nearly every single one of their demands had been met, although the movement itself had dissolved. Um, and they were met through a series of what were called reform bills. They were reforming Parliament and the right to vote. So that by the time the importance of, a, of being earnest is on stage, the vote in Britain extended to almost two thirds of men. And we'll come back to that, the fact that it was only men. Um, but other key things included a secret ballot that stopped a lot of corruption and um, fairer constituencies because the Industrial Revolution had changed how many people lived in each town and there were things like, you know, there was a hill in Shropshire that sent two MPs to Parliament and the whole of Manchester didn't have one at the start of the 19th century. Um, so that's just brief background. Uh, but one of the things that Lady Bracknell mentions is, you know, the uh, terrible happenings of the French Revolution. She says it reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. So that's uh, Oscar Wilde's making a satirical reference to the fact that the ruling classes did have this perhaps well-grounded fear of revolution from below. Uh, the French Revolution that she refers to was the Revolution of 1789, which I'm sure you've heard or seen um, ideas of with people having their heads guillotined off them. Um, so it led to what's called the Reign of Terror between 1793 and 94, and that's the bit that you know, particularly aristocrats were terrified of because there were people being guillotined um, and it was quite terrible uh, and lots of destruction of property as well. Then 50 years later the so-called year of revolutions in 1848 there were popular uprisings across Europe against repressive governments. These were often monarchist, they didn't have any form of representative parliament at all, uh, Italy, Germany, France and Austria. Um, so what I'm trying to get you to see is that Lady Bracknell's fears were always at the back of the ruling class's mind. Um, the Chartists delivered a petition to Parliament in 1848, this year of revolution, which was reiterating their demands, and they were forbidden to march through London. So this, you know, fear that too many people together might form a revolution at any point was, was fairly widespread um, in the ruling classes. Um, we do get references to Parliament, uh, Lady Bracknell talks about the radicals at one point, um, and I think she mentions the two parties, uh, which I'll explain to you. So, at the beginning of the 19th century, the well, all throughout the 18th century, the, the what we call the two-party system had developed in, in British politics. So there was um, the party that governed and the party that was in opposition. Uh, those parties were known as the Conservative and the Whig Party. We don't have the Whig Party anymore. Uh, the Conservatives were sometimes and still are called Tories. That was actually an insult when it was first used. Um, and, you know, roughly speaking, the Tory Party represented the landed interests of the aristocracy, 
and often stood against parliamentary reform, um, whereas the Whig Party and then the Liberal Party represented middle class interests such as trade and manufacture. You will notice there was no overall party representing the working class um, because they didn't get to vote, so no one represented them. There were MPs demanding democratic changes to the voting system. There were MPs who wanted to represent the working class and they were called radicals. And Lady Bracknell refers to the radicals uh, at one point in her conversation with Jack. Um, so it was about 1859 when the Whigs joined the radicals and that became the Liberal Party. So those were the two parties. And roughly speaking, someone like Lady Bracknell would support the Conservatives. Uh, the other thing Lady Bracknell talks about is education. Once again, Wilde is quite satirical and ironic about education, but this was a big reforming issue in 19th century Britain. Um, demands for mass education were closely associated with campaigns for workers' rights. One of the arguments against giving working class men and women the vote is that they weren't well educated enough and therefore they couldn't vote. So the answer to that from those people was, OK, then give us education. Uh, so once voting was extended in the Third Reform Act, Parliament saw the need to educate more people. Uh, but also they were a bit scared at this point that Germany was catching up in, as an industrial country and they had a much better education system, uh, as did America, and America was catching up as an industrial nation as well. Um, so there, was, there were commercial economic reasons to start educating the mass of people. So a range of acts were passed between 1870 and 1893, which established compulsory education for children aged between five and 13. That, that upper age rose gradually throughout the 19th century. Schools became publicly funded, that is from government taxation, although parents who could afford to were expected to pay, so it's what's called means tested. It was a very limited curriculum, uh, focused almost exclusively on what is incorrectly called the three R's, but you may have heard that expression, reading, writing and arithmetic. Uh, so quite a boring, utilitarian sort of curriculum. I'm going to stop there. Uh, I'm going to load this one up and see how it goes. Okay.